Hey, good morning, everybody. Are you able to hear us? We know you were able to hear us when you weren't supposed to. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Our, our, Courtney has been very helpful. <laughs> Thank you, Courtney. <laughs> um, so uh, we want to get started. Maybe quickly we can introduce ourselves. Um, after we do that, I'll share a little bit of an agenda for the day, share with you guys what we're going to go through. We think this will take about an hour. It could be a little more. It could be a little less. Um, so I'll introduce myself. My name is Al B. I work as a VP of operations at SmartCrown. Um, and I'm very grateful that you all chose to join us today, that you all chose to be here uh, during a work day and to learn about the product that our team has made. Hi, uh, my name is Michael Hack, and I'm the field application specialist team lead, as well as the field application specialist for the East Texas area of our headquarters region. And I am the customer facing person that help people with services as well as the uh, sale and support of the drug. I'm Taylor Dixon. I do most of the data design and uh, processing development. Um, and other than that, really just all things data. Cool. Um, so a lot of you, uh, a lot of you wrote in leading up to the event. Maybe you can see us this way. A lot of you wrote in leading up to the event um, over a quarter of you, I believe, are using LIDAR. That could be drones or terrestrial LIDAR. Uh, we got a lot of questions about processing LIDAR data, and we'll go through those questions in a second. Um, we bulk all your questions into different genres or groups, and we'll also take questions live in the chat as we go through. So we're going to try to make it a discussion format and also a discussion with you. So if anything comes up throughout our conversation, just type your question in. Um, before we get started with all the questions that were written in and the discussion, we wanted to welcome Drew. Drew is our VP of Engineering at SmartGround, and Drew has a Discovery 2 unit that he's going to share with us. He's going to share some of the features and upgrades um, and a little bit of voice from our engineering team um, and what we've been working on and what's improved with the Discovery 2. So maybe Drew, hand it off to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Drew Weikers. Um, it's going to take about a half an hour to go through our engineering processes and what it takes to make the Discovery 2 available for everyone. Just kidding. It's going to be about a two-minute uh, quick introduction to what this is. Hopefully, everybody's seen it. Um, you know, I hope everyone's having fun. We like to have fun around here. One of my goals is to stimulate questions from everybody and hopefully just let you know what we've been doing with the platform. I do have my notes, so I will refer to them. I'm not as polished as these guys over here. That's why I'm going to speak for two minutes. <laughs> Uh, so we're really close to the customer. What I want to do is make sure you ask questions. The fun thing is, is that this is touch base for our customers. So hopefully this is an engaging session. Hopefully what you see here will start to drive some of those questions. Uh, it's really important to me as, as the engineering person, uh, because that's what drives our product. We really don't make this product in a vacuum. We've been really, uh, engaged with surveyors and people like that, uh, to build the product as it is today. So we go from feedback to the engineering process takes about two weeks. Then we spend another two weeks testing and about a week or two uh, to get it to our manufacturing process. So when we learn something new from the field, we can generally turn that around in about a month and a half. And that's pretty fast if you've been a part of any type of products like this. Uh, what I'm going to show you today is our first version of V2. Um, if you guys have been following us a little bit, see Michael's videos, that's a V1. So it's a kind of a different platform. Um, we've reimagined a few things to get the camera on board uh, and then improve on a lot of a few other features. Uh, so I'll just kind of go through what V2 is or what the discovery platform is, right? Uh, so underneath we have our LiDAR, we have our in our we have our camera, we have some quick disconnect legs that go in and out, and then our wings where our arms can kind of fold out, and then you spread your cross. And so if you haven't seen it, it goes pretty fast. Um, the, biggest, the biggest change, or some of the few changes uh, from V1 to V2 is has to do with our clearly controller. So before we had a ground station and we had a different controller on iPad. So we've combined that all into one using this here link platform. Um, you plan and fly your missions uh, from here. It makes life easy. Very simple, very quick to set up. Um, the other thing we got is uh, I think I didn't say it probably going too fast, but when we 
get these things in front of a customer. We kind of take their feedback and we also observe what they do and see how they use it. So a lot of little quality of life things that, you know, as us using it becomes, you know, simple and mundane. Uh, but when somebody uses it for the first time, you know, we see a lot of things that we miss. So this thumb, our thumb release for the arms is a very trick feature that we've added in the new piece um, from B1 to B2. Uh, you can see we went through these three blades. I think I showed them to you before. Uh, we did a lot of time on our weight balancing, our motor combination, ESC combination, and blade combination. Um, what we want is stable flight. We want to get into a little bit more inclement weather. So we're between 20 and 25 miles per hour comfortably. Um, we pushed it further, but what we would want people to do is stay under 20 and 25. We feel very comfortable with those flight uh, characteristics in that uh, wind range. Um, the other thing you kind of saw before is we kind of want this thing to be an industrial tool. When you see other things, you're kind of finicky on how you handle it. You probably see how I handle it a little bit. Uh, we do have a handle on top, which is something I'll go over. But um, nothing on here is very fragile. So you can see when you're taking the legs on and off, you can set it on its tail end. You're not really damaging the plastics. We built it that way. We built it for a reason. If you need to clean your LiDAR or pull your lens cap off or clean your lens, it's very easy and simple. I'll just swing it around. And so uh, you can see a two-handle piece here. So we model everything up. I think you saw that our iterations go pretty fast, is that we drew all this up. It looked good. Um, everybody was happy with it. In practice, it was a little bit more cumbersome to use. So we've gone for a single balance handle so you can pull the system with one hand and put it in and out of your face. Um, the last thing, I don't have a demo uh, for it, but we do have a new case. Um, we saw the case was a little bit cumbersome to use before. So we went to a lighter case, a smaller case. And what we've done is we've taken our batteries out of the case uh, because we've seen that people just take their batteries to their charging station. So we have standard and pro model now. So the standard is exactly what we got before, um, the chargers and the batteries. Um, but our pro model is basically you can fly a whole day with it and the chargers are built into the case. Uh, and that's pretty much all I have. Hopefully that answers some questions and hopefully spurs some other ones. But I do appreciate the time that you guys are taking. We've got three questions for you. Okay. Can missions be built on a van? You skip any of these, don't worry, because we go over them. But can missions be built on a computer and brought into the remote? Uh, well, that one's easy, yes. And then uh, two for you, what kind of temperatures can it withstand? And then please share about the endurance and wind resistance. Okay. So the endurance and wind resistance is, I thought that one, or I thought that one was coming. Uh, the temperatures, so we've flown it, we're in East Texas. Um, I'm not sure what our elevation is. We'll put it, that was already a question, 360 feet. Um, it's been very hot this year, and so we've flown in 100 plus weathers, weather. Um, all the system and sensors and everything fly just fine. We didn't see any degradation in the uh, flight characteristics of the system. Uh, we did learn something that the hotter it got, uh, we found a nuance in the system, and so we've got that put to bed. Um, as far as cold, uh, your batteries will, doesn't matter what battery you're using, they won't last as long in cold weather, so if they're cold, so you will get lower flight time. Um, I'm trying to think, we flown it um, probably in 20 to 25 degrees constantly here during the winter time, like November through February. So that's kind of our comfort zone that we've tested in. We hope that as we extend our FAS network, that this is something that we can expand upon and do you know, different types of testing, elevation testing and things like that. What was the other question? The endurance? Uh, yeah, endurance and wind. What kind of wind? So the wind, the wind is 20 to 25 mile an hour gust. Uh, that's what we're looking at. You with the three blade system, we you know really it's about the delta that concerns me. If you have a 10 to 50 mile you know per hour delta, so that's like 10 sustaining to 25 mile an hour gust. That's really what blows it off. Um, if you get, you know, we have seen gusts you know up to 30. Well, we've seen gusts a lot higher. We we pushed it. We we had a lot of wind probably two months ago, um, and we really pushed the limit. On, on what the system can do. Um, we didn't put one down, so we feel very comfortable when we say 20 or 25. And so the endurance, you know, everybody asks what flight time is. Um, because there's so many varying factors, we really want 50 acres. And what we mean when we say 50 acres is that you launch the system, you can run it about a quarter mile to a half mile away, do your 50 acres, and then come back safely. And that's how we really quantify it. So if you're thinking of planning, you would pick like a middle location in your plot, 
and then send it, do your 50 acres, come back, swap out batteries, send it, do 50 acres. Uh, and that really, you know, that helps you run through the system. Okay, I get all the questions. Uh, maybe two more. Okay. All right. How would you compare a system like this to a system like they gave an example of a specific PJI drum? And I'll take that and make it more abstract, which is how do you compare like this system to a DJI where they're adding a sensor package to the drum? Um, and then mountainous terrain was the question. So. Okay. So the uh, Michael might be better on the mountainous terrain, uh, just from a planning perspective. That's really what it all comes up down to. Okay. Um, but I can answer that quickly. So the first question was to DJI or any other type of platform that has the goals on payload. So we are a specific industrial tool, right? Um, the thing is, is that the whole system's integrated. You don't worry about it. We, the, the silly things that might seem silly or, or, or go along subtle is we really want the least amount of touch points that you can get. And landing gear is on our list of things to uh, simplify or either integrate fully. Um, these are, besides this and the batteries, that's the only thing you have to put on the system. You don't have to worry about your wire runs. Um, what I've seen in other systems is you have to take the uh, sensitive data wires and string them up yourselves and run those. Um, you have to bolt on your payloads. That's not really the target that we're going for. Um, you pull this thing out, you're in the air and call it two minutes. You probably move faster. I think we go up too fast now. Our GPS needs to get a GPS lock so that we can get accurate data. But um, that's kind of the difference. So you can't put on multiple payloads, but maybe that's something that people have requests, that's something that we would look at. But uh, that's that's kind of the other, I guess the other piece of it too is that, like I said, it's kind of an industrial tool. So it's not a one size fit all tool. So you saw, I can open it up. Um, people with other systems kind of cringe if we just pick it up like this and we just carry it around like that. Um, you know, like I said, set it down on its tail end. It's pretty uh, ruggedized. So that, that was our intent. was not build a flying system to bolt anything on. It's really about making an industrial tool that is similar to other tools that people use uh, in the surveying space. And so now this train, I think you guys will talk about that maybe a little bit more, but um, we'll be glad to. Okay. But yeah, not this train. I think we'll talk about the height characteristics and the train following. Um, I think probably the biggest thing about mountainous screen right now is how high are you going. So okay, that'll dictate different motors and different props. And so that's something um, that we want to learn about in the near future. But I know you guys are doing mountainous train in Alabama. You're able to do train following and get good data out of that. Sure. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank, you. thank you guys. Before we jump into some of the questions that came in advance, uh, do you want to talk about our terrain informed life a little bit? Or is there anything that Bruce shared that picked yeah, up on one thing um, about some of the bolt on solution, kind of the data quality that you expect out of that? When we uh, kind of really attacked the problem and made the product, we really made it for the surveying industry and understanding that the surveying industry you have folks who are the surveyors doing all the drawings, doing the stamps, licensed professionals, but then they all often operate a field crew that'll go out and collect the data, be run and kind of have their own expertise around that. And so we really made this to work with a field crew. So they don't necessarily have to be the LIDAR experts. We made the tools easy enough to use and kind of deploy so they can rely on getting that data to you every single time with consistency. And then we actually have one more question. I think you'd be right up the alley with the answer, Taylor, but it's, it's about the camera. So they're just asking about what fiber sensor and what camera and what kind of camera is put on now. Sure. Um, we have that a little bit later, so I guess we'll kind of attack it now. Um, the LiDAR we utilize is an Alistair LiDAR. Uh, what's really cool about that is it's a spinning, uh, it's kind of a mixture between a uh, rotating LiDAR and a flash LiDAR. And uh, it allows for a lot more robustness because inside of it, it's more robust than, say, a valid iron system that has multiple lasers. Um, so it gives us a lot more longevity with the product using that type of light. The camera, we also we use a global shutter camera that integrates directly into our uh, payload that is paired with the LiDAR and the IMU very closely. So that way with that global shutter, we don't have to worry so much about extremely windy days causing a bunch of blur in the image or anything. And so we really tightly control our camera models and our lensing models. That gives us some of the features that I'll talk a little bit later 
a simpler question about how we do our uh, fourth and what say generally. Yep. And then you guys gonna find a touch on the rain falling a little bit? Yeah, yep. that'd be great. Yeah, so to answer that rain falling kind of mountainous condition uh, question, uh, we've, uh, engineering team, has been able to add terrain following into our planning software. And what that allows us to do is take a fairly low resolution terrain model of the earth and import that automatically into our mission using a checkbox. And so, uh, of course, as with any UAS operation, you can be maintaining visual line of sight and you know, double confirming that it's following the terrain properly. We can now follow terrain, which really eases up the mission planning uh, side of things, that the, uh, you know, checking all your altitudes, finding the perfect launch location and stuff like that. Uh, has been eliminated, thankfully. Uh, I think a lot more user friendly. Yeah, that really helps with challenging terrains. It is historic data, so it's not actively collected data. It's coming from public terrain and elevation data, and that's why we keep an eye on it. We pay attention, like Michael talked about. Um, Michael, we have some questions that are about um, topics that I'm seeing that we do have in the slides. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if for a foundation, will you share with us this, the processor that we use? So um, okay. for the audience, Drew shared the hardware part of what Smart Drone produces, which is the drone and the collection device. Um, and we always say collect, process, deliver. The delivery is on you, uh, but the processing part is the other part and it's a piece of software. This is a piece of software that isn't a subscription model to use. When you make a discovery to purchase, this is a piece of software that gets installed on your computer. Um, and what it does is it automates the majority of the LiDAR and photo processing steps that you would need um, to start delivering really useful information. So, Michael? Yeah. So, I'll just pop this processor up right here. All right. Looks like it's up there. So, this is our processor, and this is going to answer that GPP question that's on the chat as well. So first thing we do is we'll click and we'll find our mission file that we want to process. And that's as simple as just finding your file, going in, and then you're just directing the processor to the uh, file. Click open there. You'll set your uh, system, the zone that you're in. You have all the uh, states available. You can go to your base station. And so the way we derive our accuracy using our uh, drone is using PPK corrections from a static base recording an observation on a known point. And the way that works is instead of having to put ground control targets out to shoot them in with RTK, we're going to be able to go right up and correct the path of the drone using our onboard APX 15, which is an Aplanix, uh, the Trimble product made by Aplanix. And that allows us to get post corrections uh, for the drone to get that two tenths accuracy for one foot contours. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of uh, expand upon that yeah, a little bit. Good. We definitely did a lot of learning when talking, as Drew said, working closely with surveyors. And we realized that while we could build an R2K solution that keeps that connection and offer a base station with it, most surveyors already have across their base station that they've integrated into the field. With it. So it's really important to us to uh, be able to use the base station that they already have as a part of their normal operation to uh, correct all the drone app and make our line our active. Yep. And so as we continue on the processor then using their race station, they're able to import the point values that they want. So this is something really handy whenever you're working in a, a scale factor environment or something like that. Uh, you input your base coordinate and the drone data will project relative to that base coordinate that you input, uh, which comes in really handy, like I said, when you're dealing with a scale factor, like for a text dot job, for instance, would be one of our local instances or something like that. You can also add in any RTK shots that you take into the uh, that you export as a text file. You have the ability to add it to our processor, choose the delimiter, and then it'll pop up a window that allows you to choose the east and northing and vertical component, as well as the shot label. And then we can also select our output grid distance. We can put that uh, that finished result of how far away all these points are from each other into any any setting that we want. We have a checkbox where we can process the LiDAR data or wait yes. Just to chime in on the grid distance, because one of our questions later on talks about that 25 or 20 foot grid as an example. So right when we're at this step, uh, I'll clarify, when we click process, we, we also uh, put out a one foot ground grid. And this grid distance is subsampled or decimated from that one foot. So anywhere where we did get data, um, we have a one foot grid. Uh, that's enough to capture a lot of features uh, on a topography, basically every 
point of interest. And we'll talk about this more. But I just wanted to point out here that you won't only get the 25 foot grid, you'll also get a full process LAS spot. So for kind of a power user or somebody who's at the edge of what can be done with the drone, we're also putting out industry standard file. But these options are meant to let someone get in um, and start working with LiDAR data in a lot more feasible way. So yeah, sorry to interrupt. No. Um, so this decides whether you propped up LiDAR data or not. And then lastly, we have added our own, uh, this is thank Taylor for building this program, but the instant smart drone orphan. What this allows us to do is using those same PPK corrections we use for the LiDAR, we use that same system and we derive them for the photos. So without using any type of ground targets or GCPs that we have to shoot in, we're able to hit a one to 50 map scale uh, using our instant ortho output in our processor. And then we also have a fixed 4 d output that puts us several specific files that you need if you prefer to go that route with your photo process. Okay. Um, do you want to stop sharing and maybe we can talk for a second yeah. and then we can share some of the questions from the slides. Um, I want to talk about the ortho and how we ended up integrating a camera, why we integrated a camera and then what, when we went out, I think that you would have heard from Drew and you heard that our engineering team is super focused on the customer and on delivering what most of our customers talk to us about wanting and needing from a collection device. And so maybe Taylor, you can chime in a little bit on why why we picked what we did, why we targeted the, the map skills that we did, and what the results are useful for. Yeah, so I'll kind of start uh, from the broader perspective of why we started with LiDAR and then the Beast of Ortho and the Discovery 2 version. Um, with the LiDAR data, we really wanted to get our feet underneath us, uh, drive into what the surveyors were asking for today, which was ground shots to kind of stop having to hike through the jungle and taking shots you know, with the sticks and kind of accelerating that workflow for them. And then when we uh, delivered that data and that data product to them, they said, well, this is great, but often in, on those projects, I also needed ortho to compare that to or to lay our one of the lines up. And so when we did our customer interviews to determine what those accuracy scalings would be, we found that they were essentially three categories. You have large maps, which are about a one inch to 150 foot scale maps. And so the accuracy standard is a little less uh, uh, strict. And then, which was kind of the class three. And then you kind of had a middle area of a one inch to 50 foot scale map for a lot of one foot contour maps, project uh, kind of summary maps and stuff like that. And then even below that, you had a one inch to 20 foot scale map, which had a lot of uh, strict criteria, especially when you're dealing with alpha surveys and other uh, products that can come off of that uh, level of accuracy. So for our first release, we targeted the one inch to 50 foot scale map. And to do that, we kind of had to go through the process of starting from the ground up with the camera and linking it to our trimble based uh, planix in order, and of course, doing all the lens modeling in the uh, necessary steps for the direct georeferencing component of it. So Michael mentioned that we don't use ground targets. We don't put that burden on your field crew in order to go out and kind of set the ground targets right, collect them right, and kind of make it more robust by just adding that direct georeferencing feature and then building it on the back end uh, and testing uh, heavily with our own QC processes to ensure when we ship, we can hit that one inch to 50 foot scale map. And um, and I'm kind of shot. Uh, I'm not sure I know the answer to, but uh, when we export, when we're processing, the user can still use like a PIX 4D with ground targets yeah. if they want to take it that far. That's right. So yeah. as I mentioned before, we do a one inch to 50 foot scale map, for most, which is good for most contour projects, larger land projects, stuff like that. And if you're really trying to take and say do an Alta survey on a parking lot where you want to contour lines around that, we, you will collect the LiDAR at the same time you collect the photos. And then at the end, you can process with the picture 4D option as we showed. And what that does is it exports a exterior orientation file. So if you've used Pix 4D before, the first step is always bringing in your pictures. And then the next step is bringing in all of the locations where the pictures were taken. And then Pix 4D will kind of do its magic and do the photogrammetry to adjust those slightly to improve the accuracy with those ground targets. So if you wanted to bring it into that level of accuracy, you're going to have to bring out your ground targets, follow the standard procedure for generating that level of accurate photogrammetry results. And then with our uh, drone today, 
you can do that and still get the same output. But then, of course, if you don't feel you need to go through that amount of rigor for that project, you always have that one inch to 50 foot scale coming out. It needs to support them. This is huge. Um, I see some questions. I want to get us started on track with some slides, uh, with some prompting, and I'm going to read some of the questions as we get started. I'll probably take the first slide because um, I think it's about the price of the drone, and then I might have a chance to read some of the questions as you guys share with the rest. Um, so, like I said, I bulked a lot of the questions into groups, and uh, I'll just share the slide every time we get to a group, and then we will all probably just look at the slides together and have a conversation where you can see our faces a little bit. So, a lot of folks wrote in and asked what the cost of the drone is, what the cost of a complete kit is, and then uh, what is the cost. I tried to remove any type of redundancies. Uh, so. The entire Discovery 2 package comes ready to fly with all the software we talked about for $65,000. Uh, we're able, there were questions about availability, which I'll talk about more at the end, but we're able to ship within the US at this time. Um, mentioning again, everything, the processing software, that's all included. Uh, Drew shared with you some developments like a kind of pro model charging case. And there are potential for accessories that you could add, like the charging case to make it easier to uh, do larger missions in one day uh, or to do more missions and cover a larger acreage. Uh, and those things will be coming along and we'll be putting some pricing on those things soon. But when you buy the Discovery 2 for 65000 it has everything you need to get started and hit the ground running collecting data right away. Anything else on that? I would just like to reiterate that from the get-go, our main uh, thesis was, hey, we want to give you the hammer to make sure that you can hit everything. And so our processing is all included, and you can process it all in-house. Absolutely. And I guess one more thing on having that all included package is you only have one support line to call. You don't need to call a separate person for the LiDAR sensor, the software you're using, or the drone platform that you're using, or try to figure out which one's causing the issue. You talk to us, it's all an in-house system, and we can find a solution for you. So, all right, we're going to jump to the next slide, and I'll provide just a quick Taylor uh, and Michael both. When you look at the differences between an aerial LiDAR platform and terrestrial LiDAR, what are some things that stand out? And then while you're sharing that, I think I'll go ahead and read some of the questions and see if I can hear sure. some ready for us. So um, a terrestrial LiDAR system, especially when we're talking about, about like a total stage, uh, we'll go and you'll set it on a point that is measured or you're planning on that measuring in post. Um, and that's going to give you very accurate, very um, precise, colorized, local kind of picture point. And then through software, you can kind of match those up or however you interpret those and bring those in. Um, with the aerial LiDAR, our target is really giving you wide swaths of ground points. And so we focus a lot of our software towards developing and uh, filtering out trees and getting a large distance. So if you have like a terrestrial total station, or even a truck, um, going through and trying to map 400, 500 acres is going to be a lot more challenging than with an area flat. Okay. And I have some cool questions here. Um, one is detailed about the field of view, the LiDAR and the camera, and whether you need to plan the mission more specifically to collect both at the same time. Uh, and it's a perfect transition into the next slide, which kind of talks about that. So we'll hold off there uh, because those questions were about how the RGB and the LiDAR interact together. And then I have two questions that talk about a warranty and maintenance and support. So I'll start by saying we are a new company. We're fresh in a lot of ways. Um, we think that our success is going to be based on taking care of the customer. Like you heard Drew talk about listening to the customer, but it doesn't stop before the sale or in engineering or after the sale. It's our job to stand behind this product. And as a, a, a company getting our start, uh, we're not gonna be successful unless our customers are. So for two years after the sale of the Discovery drug, it's covered. So if your manufacturer is warranty, you can do it as. You still take responsibility for safe flight operations. Um, and when it comes to maintenance and support systems and turnaround time, so we've restricted where we serve to the US at this time. This allows us to courier a drone out within a couple of days uh, anywhere in the country. 
Uh, so we've had experience now sending out uh, units for troubleshooting or for supporting a customer in the field. So our goal is to have a unit in your hands and help you keep making money as quickly as we can. If a customer is near one of our FASs and our service people, we oftentimes can send them out to uh, finish a job for you and help you keep being productive with the system as we work on the drone. Um, for preventative maintenance, we include that for the first two years. And as a new company, we see uh, taking the drones back, uh, depending on use, this is an hourly thing, and we're gonna inspect the bearings, we're gonna inspect the drone, make sure everything's tight, and we're gonna learn from that. So uh, today, when you make a purchase of a discovery unit, you have a lot of coverage by us as a company. There's a lot of sort of white glove service that goes into launching a new product um, at this scale. And, uh, and then really standing behind it. So we don't have a lot of the things that talk about, you know, automated processes for tracking and everything. We will continue to build those. Um, but right now we stick with good old fashioned communication and uh, just kind of standing behind what we sell. Um, so next up, uh, I have questions that have to do with how the RGB and LiDAR interact together. Sure. Um, so I saw the LiDAR field of view and camera field of view, and I'll kind of answer that in just a second. But I'll start at the top with, um, does it stitch the images together or do we don't need to join them? So what we've done is, is I mentioned, as I mentioned before, we really focused on a direct geo-referencing strategy when we developed the project. So that means that in our manufacturing process, we built in more sighting techniques to make sure that camera is clearly lined up with your uh, operating uh, INS system and also that the lens is calibrated to a high degree. So that way, when we go through and we perform the um, triangulation of those images, uh, we can be certain that they're gonna match the accuracy standards that we see in the LiDAR as well, because it's a very high accuracy INS product. Um, so in short, no, we don't need to stitch them. Uh, we provide a TIFF write out of the uh, process results. And that TIFF you can drag and drop into uh, ArcGIS, QGIS, Civil 3D, um, and other uh, whatever planning software you're using. What type of targets are used? So um, I kind of touched on a little bit before. And with the instant ortho processor, we don't use ground targets. We really focus on trying to make sure that the um, geolocation of those images are as accurate as possible when we perform a triangulation. But if you're going to be trying to achieve a one to tw one to twenty foot scale map, we suggest using your standard ground targets uh, that you would use within your fixed four D processing workflow that you've either been playing around with, with other drones or uh, that you're kind of learning for the first time. Um, a typical height that we fly, we suggest anywhere between uh, forty meters to seventy five meters during a flight, um, and just kind of the napkin map on what the overlap should be. If you're focusing just on LIDAR and you're not planning on generating and forth the mosaic, we suggest doing the same amount of basically swap width as you do your eyes. So if you're flying at 50 meters, you would do a 50 by 50. Um, and then with, if you're generating a forth the mosaic, we suggest cutting that down by half. So if you're flying at 50 meters, we suggest doing a 25 meter overlap. Now, I will say that one of the, um, keys to getting good LiDAR results through heavy vegetation is bringing that swath width down uh, to where if you're going through like Louisiana kudzu, you're probably gonna be thinking more around the lines of like 10 meter spacing. To, uh, so that way, as you're flying over that area, you're collecting more data, getting more chances to have that LiDAR penetrate through the camp. And so um, with heavier vegetation, you will have less flight area, but um, the time saved flying and versus climbing through all of that is very apparent to some of our customers in that area. Um, so work with LiDAR and takes a picture at the same time? Absolutely. So that's a main feature of the product. Uh, we, we, when you fly, you capture the LiDAR and photos and all of the data required in order to make uh, the accurate LiDAR product and the accurate work that's off of that. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, you can use Pix4D with the Pix4D option and carry that through if you're looking for something more uh, uh, more accurate, kind of that one to twenty foot scale. Or if your workflow that's kind of what you're used to, uh, we work right into that. And then I'll take the last one with the advantage of lidar over aerial photography. 
So we found that LIDAR and aerial photography are really uh, two very different data products. So with a LIDAR, it's really good at getting ground positions, giving you vertical elevations, generating your topography results, generating your uh, ground shots and stuff like that. With aerial photography, it, that's really all about giving you what's in the scene content. Uh, where is that cone? Where does the, the lead, where does that uh, parking strike lie? And those kind of uh, metric questions. Uh, and then the last one with the field of view and camera field of view, uh, as I said before, since the camera field of view does have slightly less field of view than the LIDAR, uh, we suggest kind of uh, halving that swap area when you're collecting for the camera and the LIDAR together. Um, but it's kind of numbers, the LIDAR, we keep it at 90 degree field of view, and then the camera we have is a 72 degree field of view. Cool. Um, I want to take a second because there's a lot of good detail there, and I'm going to share if you are kind of trying to keep up with us and wanting to learn more, um, I need to get to where I can click this tab. Sorry about that. Uh, check out on our website. So when you go to our website, our homepage looks like this. Go to this education section right here. And we talk a lot about Discovery 2 and some different things. There's information about the data processing. There's information about uh, flight planning and mission planning. And um, so if you want to kind of take the discussion today and take it a step further, that could be a really good opportunity to learn. And we continue to update the YouTube with uh, tons of great information. So I will look through and kind of share with uh, some of the things people ask about with applications. And uh, then Michael is going to share a little bit about the data. Um, he has some process data. He's going to share with us an ortho that we've generated and what that looks like and what the benefits of that are. And then possibly open up the data in um, Civil 3D. Some of the later questions, we more talk about that. So if we don't get to that in this first section, that's okay. So share an application example. So Michael is going to do that. Uh, we have a question about contours on a 1 to 25 foot grid. How do you keep catch ditches in between grid shots you use? It's a really good question. I think with the 1 foot grid, we capture massive amounts of information. Um, and there are ways that you can go further than the automated processing, and we deliver the full live of our data. So a user, uh, we may not share it today, but I do believe we have a video on this on YouTube that talks about cutting up the data and using it in different ways. But uh, the same way that we talk about a hybrid workflow with surveying um, traditional check shots and total station work in addition to the drone data and how they can work together, uh, when, when you do get the drone data, we don't decide what to collect. We collect everything. And we can um, use the heavy data just as easily as we can use uh, the exported ground results that are come out in an automated way. <laughs> Because you said one of my favorite words, the hybrid workflow, I'll kind of pick up on that before uh, Michael can close an example. We found that when we're talking to our customers, a lot of them have these pre existing workloads that their field teams are very comfortable with and that they uh, reliably get this result out. And they're looking to enhance that uh, workflow. And so for stuff like ditches, um, curb edges, hop toe, and stuff like that, typically we see that people that adopt our system will still go out and do their accurate top of toe, ditch shots, and stuff like that. But then everything they'll collect as well. So they, they get back and they're doing their drawings. They have those points that they can kind of anchor their drawings to, but they also have the full scene content that they can build their drawing around as well. And that really limits right. interpolation. Right. Yeah. Um, we talk about accuracy under tree campus. I know you have one of our accuracy reports. Um, we talk about ground elevation precision. This one, Taylor, while he gets to the end, maybe pick this one up, but uh, how the accuracy can change through different environments. Uh, and then will the drone do the, be able to perform a topography when there's heavy tree pressure? So I think that through your examples, Michael, this kind of application example, you'll cover a lot of those things. And I'll be reading through questions about this section and uh, any others. All right. Well, the first thing I'm going to share is a uh, our ortho. And let's go ahead and start with yeah, that. Yeah, let's go. Like that's a good, um, good start. There we go. So you guys can see, um, 
we have overlaid our ortho in this perimeter right here, I'm tracing with my mouse, onto a Google Earth overlay. And so this one, as you can see, lines up really well with the pre-existing soccer field, but a great example as to why you would want an updated uh, photo set for a job that you're working on is that they changed the orientation of the practice fields on this north side of the of this park. Um, I think zoom in a yeah, let's check out some of this resolution too as it, as it loads in. You know, these, this ortho, it's a 12.3, is that correct, megapixel camera? It is, yeah. yeah. Um, so we get really great examples of what kind of, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Scene detail. Yes, yeah, so we have this great scene detail. I mean, you can count the nets on this, uh, on this soccer net right here. Uh, and the best part about this is you don't require a subscription to produce this ortho. It comes directly out of the drone with no ground targets, as Taylor talked about some. And I'd just like to point out one thing. If we zoom in to the uh, the lines as they meet on the bottom soccer field. And so this is kind of that uh, show that when we line up to pre-existing stuff, um, it is all geolocation uh, accurate. And this is uh, all within Texas North Central, our kind of local grid. And all of our data products come out in your state plane and tied to your control point. Um, so I believe this was with um, a, one of the cities or, around here. And yeah. So this, they kind of definitely have the big control to uh, what is geo accurate. Um, but oftentimes when you're dealing with some of these old oil, oil projects and stuff like that, they're kind of operating off of a legacy control, but all the project needs to line up. Um, and one other thing I'd like to show that really kind of emphasizes the why uh, you would use this as compared to like satellite data is kind of go a little more north. You can see here that there is a change to the actual field itself to where before it was kind of the regulation side of soccer field and now they have a practice pitch here uh, that was captured with the orbit. Yeah, thank you, David. We had one serious question about thread count of the net is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I counted it, yeah, yeah. <laughs> At the end, we'll go and we'll start counting. <laughs> um, yeah, and so I'll walk through this one really quick. It is. I will share when we when you move the screen, uh, sometimes it's going a little slower than okay. it was when we tested it. So I'm sure that be aware. So I'm going to bring in everything here first. So our output from our processor, as Al talked about earlier, is this entire cloud. You know, every tree, leaf, branch, and you can see the cars even in there in the data a little bit. And then our processor is also going to output a one foot grid. So this one foot grid gives you the ground, you know, this is inside a vegetated area where my mouse is over here. And then as you can see, this is a wide open area where we got just fantastic resolution on the ground. And this is all subsampled as well. Uh, and then we take that one foot grid, it's rasterized and really uh, our two tenths accurate result. And we subsample that even further to be able to use easily in your CAD software. So this 15 foot grid would go straight into civil 3D and you can generate your contours with relative ease. And what uh, outputs? Are each of these because then the full resolution one is the LIS industry standard. Yeah. So our full resolution, as he said, is an LIS. Uh, we can move it through, you know, various different uh, high level softwares and such. It's fully compatible. And then our smaller outputs, this one foot grid and the 15 foot grid that's up on the screen right now, is what's called an XYZ. But when we boil that down, it's a text file, very similar to what comes out of your collector tablet and imports into your CAD softwares in the same fashion uh, by just adding a point file. Hey, can you bring up the strip of tree data again? Yeah, sure. So uh, I want to point out this section as an example of how you could achieve a hybrid result. Mm -hmm. So when you quick process with the smartphone processor, you end up with the full LIS. You end up with the one foot grid anywhere where we have ground strip shots to a high degree of certainty. And then you end up with the subsampled or decimated result. And if you wanted to create a surface with a hybrid uh, result, you have to put in a little bit more effort. You'll have to learn to manipulate the data just a little bit more. We do provide videos and training, and we can work with customers on how they can do that. Um, but the same way that you have every tree, branch, and leaf in this strip, you can imagine cutting out different sections of data that haven't been subsampled or decimated or that, that seem useful to you. And you can merge these results very easily. And you can generate a surface from merged results. So if you had a specific feature that you can see in the full LiDAR result, 
You can cut features like that out. You can learn to manipulate them a little further than the automated processing, and you can really take it a step further. Yeah, thank you, Al. Can we talk about just bringing that grid in as a surface really quick? Absolutely. So when we, uh, we'll pop over here to Civil 3D. And looks like it's up on the screen. So you guys can see this, the contour that we're able to generate. And the process to go through this, I'll show you guys, it's pretty simple. We'll just start a new drawing and let that load in. I'm gonna click surfaces and right click and say, create a surface. We'll go through and we'll pick the surface style we want. Typically what we hear people want to develop is a one foot contour. And we'll click OK and that'll populate there. And it'll automatically change that second one as we continue in. So now we'll click this plus sign, click on surface one. We'll open up this definitions tab and we can just select point files. All we have to do is right click, select add. We'll click this green plus button on the right side of this pop up window. We'll add in our 15 foot grid, that's the XYZ file format. All you have to do is click open. And then as it loads in the points, we'll scroll down and we're a space delimited east, north, up file. And we'll click OK. Now it's going to load these points in. And as soon as it's done, we can select surface, right click on it, and select zoom to. And now our contours are geolocated in CAD. Uh, and if you already have a boundary survey done, survey done, it's in the same system when you pop this in. Uh, It'll go in just like your other points where it'll pop inside your break lines and your boundary. It'll cut off the extra data and it just, I mean, it fits right into your workflow, just like a topo out of a collector tablet. Thanks, Michael. Uh, so we're coming up soon on an hour and uh, we're going to keep going through this. If you have any schedule limitations, if you have any um, anything coming up, uh, that would prevent you from continuing to watch with us. We're going to be recording it, so it's a good time to remind you this is being recorded. It will go up on YouTube. Um, and we've also had people reach out to us throughout the process, say, hey, make sure you're recording it and send it to me after. We'll follow up with you all by email and send you a link once this is on YouTube. Um, and that way you'll have a chance. So if you do have to get out of here, that's okay. Um, but we will continue going through the slides. If you'll bear with me, I got locked out for one second. All right, so I have my slides here. I'm going to share my screen again. And I'll share with you guys each of the questions from this one. Excuse me, everybody. So we talked about the application examples. Uh, I'm gonna combine the next two a little bit and I will share the questions and then we can have a discussion again. So uh, what are the biggest misconceptions with LiDAR drones? What limitations do LiDAR drones have? Um, and then talking about our system specifically, what's the max flight time? And uh, some of this we've already covered a little bit, so we might go a little quickly through it. That's okay. Uh, and we might miss some of it because it's already in the report. Uh, different system info we think is relevant. What sensors are being used? We have talked about that. Do the drones use a satellite link or operate independently? So we'll try to figure that out. And then what is the warranty for the drone? We've definitely talked about that so far. So. Uh, getting started, what are some limitations and misconceptions about LiDAR and LiDAR drones? Yeah, I'll just take off that one. Um, I think when I started my career in packing the LiDAR drones and uh, really developing the product, you know, you kind of start off with the idea that, wow, this is really such great technology and we're this is really going to take over the industry and it's going to like just be G with LiDAR drones flying everything. What we learned with limitations is that it really is about making it a tool for the surveyors that they are comfortable working into their workflows and that they are comfortable using within their uh, drawings and license stamps kind of concise output to their civil engineering clients. Because while surveyors can, can consume all of this data and in-house surveyors with civil engineering firms do, typically the drawing output to their stamped results is really what the end product is going to be. And so while the collection and the technology is all um, great, but we're here and what our limitation is really to service and provide the best data to our surveying clients. Yeah, they say we just don't want raw data. We don't want just the raw result. We want a lot of the process performed for us. And that's where the processor came from. Right. 
And I think we kind of split up, you know, if the question was limitations or something. Can but, it back up. Um, we can split that up into two different sections where we have one, like our drone itself. If you purchase it, you'll be able to go out and fly these things on your own. You'll be able to process the data with our included processor. Um, and that'll do like 95% of the workload. And then there'll be some slight, you know, manual manipulation of the data. And then you'll move forward to your finished product. Or we also provide our services that's a little bit different where we're going to go out and fly the job for you. We're going to go through the data and QC it and check it using traditional RTK equipment as well. And then we'll deliver a turnkey solution. So I guess there's kind of two different limitations you can look at whether you're purchasing or going through the uh, services route as well. Okay. And I'll say uh, misconceptions. Mm -hmm. um, well, really quick, I got a question. It's, with the LiDAR unit mount and be able to do building in spirit, so no, not um, we don't have any SLAM algorithms going, so we do depend on a direct georeferencing. And what that means is we're, we're taking the same GNSS connections that surveyors are using on their um, ground equipment, and we're talking to those same satellites. We'll talk to 16, uh, 20 or more satellites at a time. And uh, we're using that. Every single pulse from the LiDAR is being tagged with the GPS result. So if we didn't have that super precise GPS connection, we wouldn't be functioning very well. Um, and it, it also goes to what we do as a company. We're very focused on working with surveyors, civil engineers, and earth workers. And we're very focused on delivering topographic data. So, and, and to piggyback on that, um, the question earlier about the, the difference between terrestrial LiDAR and aerial LiDAR, this really gets to the core of that, where these total stations today have fantastic outputs for inside building, full colorized, extremely accurate, but it's all kind of a fixed location. Um, with the aerial LiDAR, again, we're really good at getting large mass coverage, giving you the entire scene, and getting that field crew enhanced so that they're not spending, say, a month on a large job. They're spending a week using our LiDAR to get all the hard stuff and then working it into their hybrid work. And I, when it comes to biggest misconceptions of LiDAR, and I'm going to take aerial LiDAR, that's what yeah. you're familiar with, is um, it's that it's a single solution for every single problem that a surveyor encounters. We go back to the hybrid workflow over and over again, um, but we really, 80% of what this drone is going to be really, really good at is covering a large topography, gathering wealth of data very quickly, not choosing what to scan, so really eliminating a lot of interpolation and punching through a canopy. Um, but it would be a misconception to say that that's going to replace the work that a ground crew does or that that's going to get you to the corner of a building to the level of accuracy you need to be in the built environment. So that would be one misconception I've got. Um, my other one's easy is that people sometimes believe it might see through things. And that is, that's not the case. It is a line of sight sensor. So you, you do have, if you have a uh, jungle coverage with multiple layers of canopy in South America, I believe uh, you, you wouldn't be able to get through all this. Yeah, Our, the way we do is, is if the sun can penetrate it, we can penetrate it. If you go to some places in like Brazil, Amazon, it's dark on that floor. Um, one of the things I will say, uh, misconceptions and the built-in versus the, versus the aerial, is that a lot of times when you're doing these built-in environments, you also have to do like, water edge where you have to do um you know kind of stick it in a creek or something like that and the liner doesn't penetrate too long uh long okay excellent um uh, going forward a little bit i know we've covered a lot of the general system specs i'm going to move on from that and differentiators i call this differentiators because it's maybe ways the smart room could be a little bit different and I'm glad to cover it pretty quickly. So, which LiDAR providers fly on their drones? So we have drones in the field with land surveyors and with the reseller, and we have our team that provides professional services, which you can learn more about on our website, and they fly the discovery drones, and they go out and do a turnkey DIFY or do it for you service. Um, is the device available to be attached to other drones? No. So you heard her talk about it's an integrated system. We see massive benefits to having something that's completely integrated. It protects the sensors. It prevents the user from having to assemble things when they want to start to fly. Um, and we see there's big advantages to that. Plus the quality of turns that we get out by wrapping it, sealing it, and making sure that it's going to deliver quality data products here at the time compared to hoping that you assemble it. Yeah, it is all calibrated from, from the factory. Um, 
And Michael brought up a really good point about that too, is that with whichever platform you go forward with, it won't be a straight line to success. You will have a learning curve. You will have things that you had misconceptions about. And so having a company that's all in one, that's completely integrated as your solution, um, that's very helpful for that learning process because you, you don't have multiple people to contact. So we're very focused on creating an integrated system that's a tool for capturing topographies. Um, and which softwares are gonna be used to open big LAS files? Well, the good news about LAS is if you're worried about using the full result, our, our file can be brought into any common tool that you wanna use as an LAS file. Um, and a kind of a misconception there is that all LIDAR results are too difficult to open up in something like CAD. So when you see our ground shots, when you see our grid uh, outputs that are decimated and subsampled, uh, it's important to know why we did that. We've done those as ASCII readable files to create surfaces like Michael showed you. So you don't need special software. Now you can take it there. And by ASCII readable file, we mean the same file that you could open up in Excel. And uh, we really wanted to um, replicate a collector tablet so that a field crew returning has the same type of data for your workflow that you would expect uh, from, you know, just kind of the normal uh, rod and receiver pair. So there's some really good questions. Uh, I have a question about planometric feature collect correct collection. Um, I don't know if we have an example right now. Uh, we have a question about, can it be used with no cell service? Yes, if you don't have to have service, you can plan your missions and download the relevant data in the field and you can run the drone and collect data. And we're, can, out, we're out in East Texas, there's a lot. <laughs> we don't have cell coverage. Yeah. yeah, and you can also process the data in the field for a preliminary result uh, that doesn't have the base corrections, is that right? Oh, we can do the base corrections now as well. Without an internet service. Yes, yes, that's huge. Typically, though, when you do the base corrections, you have to take down your base. As we've seen in survey workflows, it's kind of an end of the day activity because they kind of have a whole crew operating on the that one base. Okay. Um, and any current plans to offer an upgraded camp? I'll let you take that. Um, so, right now, we're really honing in the, uh, the camera outputs and offering kind of the uh, Forward model, you can have any model T as long as it's black. Uh, so that way we can assure the quality with that one lens system. Uh, as far as upgrading our camera, we really focus on deriving a spec based out. So for us, this is a machine that gives ortho mosaics and not necessarily uh, 20 megapixel full hyper resolution single image. So when we set out, we knew our accuracy from just kind of the math around the INS system, and we derived that an inch GSD would really kind of be the target of um, ground sample distance that we could achieve and really want to achieve before we kind of push even further. Uh, and with an inch GSD, you're typically talking about 120 scale map. And with the amount right now, we're typically operating around two centimeters, 1.5 centimeter to two uh, with our highest GSD. Ground samples, which is under uh, Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I see some questions about specific projects. Feel free to reach out on our website, uh, share project details. We often use a KML or AMZ to communicate apples to apples uh, what, what a job looks like. And that helps us to be able to say whether it's fit for us or not from a services perspective. Yeah. And also, we're deploying new service members all throughout the country. Uh, yeah, so there's a lot of states we can't reach north in the country at this time. But as you know, the next six and twelve months goes on, that should change. Um, also, as we do a lot more uh, testing in different topographies and elevations, we talked about with some good feedback on early. Um, so data processing questions, uh, and really quick, just so everyone knows where we're at. I think we have just one more slide. So we're starting to get toward the end. If you have any questions or things you've missed, feel free to share them. If we don't get to them here in the next few minutes, uh, we'll try to get back with you directly. Um, so data processing, we can see some different questions on the screen. I'm not going to answer these one. Uh, I'm just going to share them. So can it be processed in-house? Should you use a consultant? Does your processing software have the ability to generate a break line? Will your results work with any software? Are they compatible with AutoCAD? I'm um, also okay. thinking a couple of them. Hold uh, on. So, and then what are the computer specs you recommend? So, I'm going to stop this, this slide. Gotcha. There we go. So, um, can the data be processed in house? 
Yes, absolutely. And that's um, really the way that we designed it so that the surveyor has full control over their processing. They don't have to worry about their internet connection and their upload or download and all that jazz. Um, should be processed by a consultant. The automated processor is going to bring you all the way to that one that one foot ground resolution as well as GSD and orthos. Um, typically, any further uh, processing, reach out to us. We love ha having our FASs in the field help uh, with kind of instructing through. And we've seen it take maybe two or three times when you kind of get the full uh, integration into your workflow with the process. Um, does your process have any ability to generate break lines? No. When we talk to surveyors, we've really seen that the break line generation is very scene dependent. And so there are tools out there like TopoDot, um, or uh, frankly, if you kind of work with it in Civil 3D, you can kind of derive some of these break lines as well. Uh, but as far as just automating the break lines, I think there are a lot of ways that we could uh, uh, go awry and start to step in on some of the responsibilities of and wants of any uh, survey outfit. Um, does it work with any software? So again, we output a, a, a XYZ ASCII file that replicates the raw and receiver uh, tablet that you have. And so if, if if you have a tablet that collects basically east and north up values and bring them into any uh, surveying soft CAD you want, it'll work with that software. Is it compatible with AutoCAD Math 3D? I don't use AutoCAD Math 3D. I don't know sure what that is. We use Civil 3D on the regular basis. Yeah, we use so I have to look at Math 3D. Yeah, Math 3D. And just as a uh, aside for the orthos, we output as a GeoTIFF with the kind of the industry standard uh, for outputting what mosaics. That GeoTIFF is uh, well known to have stamped, meaning that when you bring it in into any uh, GIS software, it has all the state plane information that are processed. In Two, and it's also brought to that control point. So um, when you're operating with it, you can kind of trust that that's going to line up within that one inch to 50 foot scale map actors. Um, and then what are the computer specs recommended? I guess you guys have more experience in kind of what the computer is processing. Yeah, I'll talk about it. And on the compatible softwares, we have people that are using Bentley products, MicroStation, Civil 3D, Carlson. Um, our field services met crew members use Carlson. Uh, we also are very familiar with Civil 3D. But like Taylor said, being an ASCII readable output, uh, we're able to bring that in just like work from a tablet, and we don't run into a lot of compat or really any compatibility issues when you're trying to bring in the ground data. Um, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of context and background information people have about LIDAR in general. When they think about trying to bring the full LIDAR file, many gigabytes, into some of these CAD softwares, um, and so that's why we've chosen to go at it from a different way that really empowers the customer. Um, computer specs, so we can process the data all the way down to like an i5 processor with about 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, it, all you're doing is taking the results from the smart drone processor and then taking that and putting it in CAD. Um, that is all you need. That data is going to process very quickly. We also have computers on up to the newest, most modern specs and also with more RAM. And where that benefits you is if you want to start manipulating the data, if you want to start dealing with larger and larger jobs, having that all loaded into the RAM really speeds up the process. There's a lot less crashing. And so what you can do is you can upgrade just the computer's RAM, and that can make a big difference. Um, but we're, we're able to run things on very low spec computers, mm -hmm. and that's a big part about not having the surveyor change so much of their workflow. Uh, so you can do this without a lot of processing horsepower and you can get great results um, and you can start to edit the data but if you notice that you're dealing with waiting for load times and things between the steps that's where you might look to do something different but it's not a requirement yeah if i could piggyback on that like i was saying it's all about the size that you're working with so if you're flying uh two flights for a job so it's you know 100 acres max basically the job that i five like 16 gigabyte it's going to be great. Um, but as you move on to like five or six flights that you're trying to edit and, you know, sink into ones, then, you know, maybe you'll consider a slightly higher grade processor and maybe like 32 gigs. You know, so it's all very linear uh, as far as like what you need. And, but yeah, I was using, I don't know, seven months uh, on an i5 with uh, a pretty low RAM uh, until recently we upgraded it. So, yeah. And Again, it's all really all about time, especially as you uh, do this in ortho. There are basically steps of working with the images, correcting them. And so um, the, 
you were kind of mentioning that this new computer that we just got, it really cuts down the time processing as well as the amount of editing. So, yeah. Uh, so you can get started with very little. Uh, question, and um, I'm going to let you, Taylor, take us through some of the prompts on the processing questions and how you learn them. Before we get there, um, two good questions here. So can you process other drone data in the smart drone processor, and is the full point cloud classified? Sure. So with other drone data, uh, we do a lot in order to tailor uh, our sensors to each other in order to provide accurate data set outputs. And so, no, um, our processor is tailor made for this system and, uh, and specifically tailor made. And, <laughs> All <right>. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so it's tailor made for our system. And we uh, really hone in around uh, making sure that the data you collect off of ours generates accurate results. Um, and then the other question was about that you got off the prompt. Yes, yeah, so is the full point cloud classified? Um, we don't do classifications for object features. Uh, there are a lot of cool software that you can bring in our LAS into that will do that off classification for you and Google Docs, stuff like that. Our main focus is really classifying the ground shots and making sure they're accurate. So that way we can essentially go through and provide uh, accurate topographies and really put all our efforts into that. Awesome. Uh, so we have a few slides. I'll make it so that you can view these, Michael. Uh, and we'll just share it here, and then we'll kind of close out. So any other questions you want to get in, let's get them in. Uh, and we have a few notes. Specifically, people want to know about the processing learning curve. Uh, so Taylor, do you want to kick this off? And Michael, feel free to chime in. Well, I think um, the processing learning curve, as far as working with the processor itself, is very simple. We kind of walk you through uh, what it looks like to use. Um, it's very similar to setting up, say, like a base station or anything else within a civil green project, putting the base station coordinates in, lining up your check shots, clicking go. With the learning curve afterward, you get the uh, results uh, of the ground shots and those sub-sample results to bring them into civil 3D, and that's kind of that first step. And then um, using kind of taking the next step of, okay, I wanted to go do a very intense uh, Zoom Louisiana mission and processor, I have this gap here which I want to grab a point off of. Okay, well, how do we walk through and kind of do some extra stuff on top of that to fill any holes that the automated processor misses? Uh, I don't know, Michael, how long would you say it takes to train a customer to kind of? Uh, a couple days, I would say, of uh, you know, and that's included with the purchase of a drone. But the uh, the software cloud compare looks pretty intimidating at first. There's lots of features which make it a really great program to use. But uh, I'm sure you guys probably remember learning your CAD software and how it was really, really overwhelming at first. And now, as you go through and use it on a day to day basis, you just find more and more features, and you get faster and faster with it. And uh, this cloud compare software is the same way. So as you continue to use it more, it's just like a muscle. You'll just you'll get stronger and faster, and you'll end up being able to do things you didn't even realize you could do it. Before. You mentioned a couple of days. Um, is that that includes that's kind of our deployment process when we uh, deliver? Do you want to kind of go over a little bit of that? Yeah. So when we deliver a drone, we include about two days of training. Uh, we'll teach you how to fly the drone. We'll teach you how to plan the missions, assemble it, charge the batteries. You know, really just everything you need to know. And then we'll also teach you, you know, usually spend a majority of the time teaching how to get that data into the processor, process it, which is a pretty simple process, and then go over to Cloud Compare and look through the data, subsample it to different, you know, grid sizes. Uh, we had a question earlier about like uh, creeks and the rest of the data. So if you wanted a 50 foot grid on the entire job and a 10 foot grid and a creek line, you know, we'll show you how to do all that stuff. And it's really pretty simple to do once you get it, uh, kind of get the process going a couple of times. You just learn it, and it's yeah, it, it's a walk in the park after that. And I, and uh, two things that come to mind. First, uh, after that initial training, it is typical that customers will have more questions. That's why we output a ton of videos. It's so that we can spend some time on the phone, understand what the goal is, or what they're trying to do with the data now, or what they're stuck with, and then we can share with them something really easy to fall back on if we're not there. Um, and I'll say that when it comes to learning at, to use the data at a higher level, the nice thing about this platform giving you results that you can use from day one 
is that I've seen a lot of customers looking at different LiDAR products and they stop this, they stop the purchasing process as soon as they realize how much goes into processing the data. So I think I've said it once in this presentation, but something I'm really proud of with the tool that we've put out is that from day one, you have a tool where you plug in a base file, you get ground shots out, and you can begin to learn. You can start to manipulate things. You can have full ownership of the process from end to end. And then as you feel comfortable with that, you can start taking it further. And there is a wealth of data in LiDAR. We are collecting millions and millions of points, and uh, it can be really, really useful information. And so this provides sort of a gateway into learning about it and getting started and starting to build your skill set uh, it's a really user-friendly way. Cool. The other question I see here, um, what is the lag to expect from the processing of point clouds? Uh, typically, we've seen that if you fly a 15-minute mission uh, with something like an I-9, you, you can expect about a 15-minute processing time for the point cloud and about a half hour to 40 minutes for the able to uh, and then, of course, as you kind of scale back your processor, that might extend some of those processing times. But in general, the processor as well, you can queue up a bunch of different. So say you've gone out one day and you've done uh, a ton of missions uh, around this one phase. You could queue all those up for the evening, let it roll. By the time you come in the morning, it'll all be. Yeah, we often will put over 10 missions in a yeah. day. Um, and often Michael will have them processing as he's driving back to the office because he queues it all up and gets it started just yeah yeah and it'll be usually done by the time we get back and yeah that 15 minutes and then the 45 minutes total for the yard though that was off my i5 um so it's yeah and i haven't even tried it out yet on this i9 mm -hmm. but in ortho out but i'm curious to see how much faster it will be uh but i guess i guess it touch base on like simple requirements again i know a lot of you surveyors have really great CAD, uh, CAD drawing computers. And so like one of those with an i7, 64 gig RAM, et cetera, is gonna be a, like a, a really good powerhouse for uh, processing the data quickly. And also any data manipulation you wanna learn to do to get more out of the library as you continue to grow with the next skill. More than enough. Yeah, yeah that'll be more than enough. Uh, last one that was free shared had to do with um, kind of taking the data back out from CAD. So now we've gone in, We've uh, used the LiDAR data in these ground shots. And this person wants to know about how do I stake out from the LiDAR data? I think, is that accurate? Uh, yeah, I see some of the field codes that we can uh, bring from our LiDAR data. And what we've seen some people do were what we would call power users uh, is they would have their uh, their one foot grids and then they bring the ortho in over it. And that can help kind of provide extra field codes for, well, what is that ground shot actually? Is that a road? Is that a field? Is that kind of a fence line? Stuff like that. Um, and as far as uh, the question that you had about how to kind of run that back to the states, I think at that point, you're kind of, you've gone through, you've done your drawing, you're returning back to the field to run your states, and you're going to use your same ground equipment and workflows that you typically use. Yeah. Um, for everybody that's still with us, do we have any more questions before we close out? I'll give it a couple of minutes in the chat. Um, anything that comes up, anything that you feel like we've missed. Um, and then I have a couple things to share. And maybe I'll get started on that now. And if I see anything come up, we'll get it before we close. So the couple things that I wanted to share with you, how can you work with Smart Drone? You've watched what we've talked about here today. Um, it seems like maybe there's a fit for you. Um, we can work with customers for services, which is a do it for you or DFI, DIFY, a turnkey solution. And we can do this across the southern portion of the US at this time, all the way from Arizona to Florida. We are very comfortable in these environments. We collect LIDAR and North Mosaic results. Uh, we process the data for you and we deliver the data to you in a Google Drive link or similar. So if you've had a project in mind, uh, the best thing you can do is create a Google Earth KMZ or KML and send it our way by filling out uh, some contact forms online. We will take a look at it and we can tell you very quickly, generally within 24 hours, we get some kind of a phone call. We'll discuss the project with you and we can see what we can or can't do. So that would be a turnkey way to use the discovery tool and the LIDAR and the data we're talking about. And there's no overhead with that. There's no commitments. There's no purchase price. Um, of course, somebody can purchase the drone. And uh, the, what that looks like is we would sell it to you. 
Uh, the training that we talked about, so you can come to us for two or three days of training. We can talk about what it looks like to go uh, out to another state and to train you that way. Um, you can call us at any time after that, and we will continue to support you and make sure that you're successful with the drone. So somebody can purchase the drone directly if they feel confident in that already, if they're ready to adopt this technology. All the software we talked about is included with that. There's not a subscription or an ongoing commitment that you have to make. Um, and you can find us on our website. Uh, before we get to that, so Courtney, uh, you started us out and you'll be in Salt Lake. So do we have plans to expand into Canada? So right now we're growing our, our services. The FASs, they can also sell the drones and support the drones. And we really like if we have a person within a couple hours, because we talked about lower units, we talked about standing behind the customer in the purchase. So uh, we feel comfortable shipping to the U.S., but we're going to grow this team up north. We're going to continue testing in different terrains and elevations and challenging the platform and making sure by hiring these uh, service providers. And so, yes, Canada is uh, absolutely something that's on the menu. Uh, we tend to do things kind of organically. So that the other good news about Canada and anything connected to us is that it's a lot easier for us to access and that makes us feel a lot safer. Uh, Michael? You've had a ton of great questions throughout this year. Your question was about updates to software and the processor. Yep. So for two years, those updates are included. So anything Taylor comes up with, um, we will be deploying updates on a regular basis. Uh, you have, you want to share a couple of things you're working on right now? Yeah, um, I'll share two things. One, how it gets updated, and two, um, what the updates are coming down the pipe. Right now, um, we kind of have uh, more uh, based the intensity and information on that full process LIS for better classifications and stuff like CocoDoc. We also have uh, more information coming with that one foot grid to help you with some of the cleaning processes where we kind of stuff some of our uh, metrics into that one foot grid. And then we also have uh, down sampled orthos. So these ortho files can be rather large at the uh, barrel sample distance that we target. And so we give you the option of saying, I want only a one foot ortho because I'm looking at a big picture here. And so that way, when you bring it to Civil 3D, it just kind of snaps in and uh, to blow it. So this is a background layer. Yep. And as somebody that uses this data fairly often as the services department, um, I, I can't tell you how excited I am. Some of the tools that Taylor showed me uh, that he's going to be adding into the next couple of releases are going to really make it easier as you, the customer, and also as uh, you know, my services guys are getting out there to figure out which points are the most reliable based on how many points we use to derive them and that you know, one foot ground grid and tools like that are gonna make it so much easier to visualize and so much more reliable uh, of that kind of looking through the data. And it's really nice to have this cyclical improvement process built into our processing uh, developments with the FASs in-house that we've talked to constantly. And then of course you guys we're talking to constantly as well to understand how we can better improve this to kind of meet your need today. Absolutely. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Um, I meant to mention how it gets updated. Uh, basically, it's very simple. We will we have a, a file that you put on a USB. You plug it into the drone. You power the drone on it. Recognize that it's the updated file, and it'll update it automatically. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for that. Uh, all right. So, how can you find us? How can you reach out? Uh, if you have different ideas about things that you would like to see in future platforms. Like Drew shared earlier, please reach out. I uh, just shared an email address in the chat that you can use. So engage at smartdrone.us. That is an email for our sales team overall. And we all have pretty high awareness of what's going on in that address. Um, you can find us on our website, so smartdrone.us. You can go to that education page and navigate to some YouTube videos. I would say subscribe to us on YouTube. We're putting a ton of video content out there. Um, but reach out online, reach out on our website. We have a bunch of contact forms now for either some interest in the drone or some interest in the services. Generally, a next step is something like a virtual demo. So before you, you know, want to make time in your day that's uh, more than just what we've done here today, a virtual demo is a really good way to have personalized response to your questions. Yep. Um, and so if you reach out, we can schedule something like that as well. And also, as we're expanding our FAS networks across the country, uh, these guys are going and visiting the local surveyor association and their meetings. And so you see them there, go say hi. Yeah, that's chat at meetings and state survey uh, associations are yeah. part, part communication. So thank you everybody for joining us. It's been an absolute honor to get to share with you some of what our team's been working on. We were really glad for all of those of you who hung around. 
Um, we really appreciate you taking the time to learn about what the team's been working on. And any questions or anything like that you have, please feel free to reach out. Um, and have a great day. Thank you guys so much. Thank you.